You know, I said to you earlier on that um, we used to say creativity isn't everything, it's the only thing. I don't believe that anymore. But I do believe, and I don't believe it because I think creativity is the most abused word in the English language next to love. So we stop talking about creativity now. We say to clients, you know, we talk innovative thinking. Because innovative thinking is actually what we do. I don't know how many of you heard the old thing about how many people does it take to change a light bulb? How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb's really got to want to change. <laughs> so how many creative people does it take to change a light bulb? Does it have to be a light bulb, is the answer. And you know, that, that, that is all about what we do as creative people, and that is that we ask questions, often naive questions, but we ask them because we're programmed to ask those types of questions because it's inherent in a creative mind. Sir Norman Foster, who is a British architect of some renown, said the greatest compliment he'd ever been paid was when his client said about him, he asks the right questions. And that is what we do. You know, that's at the heart of our motto, grasp the subject and the words will follow. And there's a thing called heuristic bias, which is a word which means that people think in familiar patterns and in familiar ways. They, their minds go down the path most well trod. And what creative people do is they avoid that. They're not interested in that. So if you're a business or a client or a company, get creative people around the table and give them a problem to solve. And you'll find that they're, they're, the way that creative people think, they will come up with some really, really interesting and unusual answers. I was briefed uh, in, uh, recently when I was overseas to judge some work for a project called A Million Trees in New York City. And it was actually Mayor Bloomberg's initiative, and what they were trying to do was to get a million trees planted by the year 2016. And they put out a competition to say, could people please come up with the best ideas and the best ways of doing that? The best solution that I came across by far was a guy that had this idea. I mean, some people were saying, why don't we do all these posters, which seems a little bit self-defeating. You know, we're trying to plant trees and we're chopping them down to make the posters to get people to plant them again. But this guy said, I've got a thought. Why don't we take the turnstiles in each of the subway stations and we have one turnstile that's green and you pay a little bit more money when you go through this one. And he'd worked out that if this is the New York subway, five million people a day travel on it. So five, five million users a day, if 10% use the green lane at a 50 cent premium, that's 50,000 people per day, that's 250,000 per week, that's $125,000 a week, that's six and a half million dollars a year, and over a 10 year period they would make $65 million. And for me, that is one of the best examples of what we do. It doesn't cost a lot of money, and it, it defies the familiar ways of thinking and working. And you know, we see it all the time. You've seen it. You've seen it here today, I'm sure. We are now in an age where we have to be more inventive and more creative and more innovative in the thinking we have for clients beyond advertising. And this installation is one example of what our Cape Town office did, and there are many others that show how our innovative thinking is extending way beyond the traditional boundaries. Um, how am I doing for time? Am I halfway? Huh? More than halfway. Okay. So I want to make this a warts and all presentation. I'm going to quickly show you an ad I did that I confess was wrong. This is it. It's for a company called, it's, it's for the CSAR. Have you heard of them? They're in Pretoria. They're a big research-based company. They said the man who believed he could break the land and water speed records in one year was a fool or a dreamer. There's no going back in life. You start something, you've got to finish it. 
But there is a universal truth his critics chose to ignore. When you take the conviction of science, a man of courage, and the imagination of both, all things are possible. Seven minutes before dusk, on the last day of the year, they proved to all men that if it can be imagined, it can be done. So, what an idiot. What an idiot I am. Because whilst the ad has a certain evocative appeal, I look back at it now and I think it was grossly irresponsible to take an organization as brilliant as the CSIR and fail to find advertising that could somehow reflect what they do actually do. Because if you meet these guys, they're all geeks and weirdos, but they do the most incredible things, like they design camera lenses that don't exist anywhere else in the world that are, like, incredible. So, so the thing for me, and we did, we did three in this series. Yeah, there was one, I haven't got the sound on this, but there was one with Thomas Edison, and... It was really about saying imagination is more important than knowledge, but it was wrong to take people from another country that have done things and by association claim that it was ours. And now I hate that. Whenever I see an ad where someone is just riding on the back of something that's happened overseas and they use it for their own ad advertising, I think it's lazy and I think it's, it's a few other things too. But ironically, they say that there's always one example that disproves the rule, and my favorite ad of all time did just that. Four years after we did this campaign, and I'm not by any means saying they cribbed this idea, but isn't it interesting that this ad ran? Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Is that or is that not a genius ad? Won't you give it a round of applause? And you know what's particularly clever is the use of their voice artist. It's Richard Dreyfus, and if you listen to the way that he delivers those lines, it's unlike any voice artist that's paid to do voice work would ever do it. He's an actor, and he, he emphasizes completely the wrong words in the wrong places, but it is and remains a genius, genius ed. And I have this incredible you know, vision that someone says, Steve, we're planning to sell the most exciting computer company in the world with grainy old stock footage of people who are dead before Apple opens its doors for business. Neat, says Steve. And you know, the great thing about Steve Jobs is what a purist he was. And I just love that about the guy. You know, they say that when, they, when Walter Isaacson wrote this book on Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs said, you can ask anybody anything. You can talk to anybody. I don't want to know what you want to write. Say good, bad, indifferent. The only thing I'm going to ask you is that you let me design the front cover because I want it to be white. Um, I want to tell you about something that is the worst thing that ever happened to my agency. You know the expression, when the gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers. And in 2006, in July, we won South African Airways. Why is everyone laughing? Um, and a bit later on that year, Sassel put their business out for pitch. And we were put on the shortlist. And then a little bit later, ABSA put their business out for pitch, and we were put on the shortlist. And then a little bit later, MTN, one of the biggest advertisers in South Africa, put their business 
out for pitch, and we were on the shortlist. We were the only agency to be invited to pitch for all three pieces of business. And it wasn't just three clients. It was three clients on three consecutive days, three pitches in December. And we couldn't decide whether to go for it or not, so we got our staff together, and the staff said, we said to them, look, you know, if we go for all three, we're probably not going to get any, but you tell us what you want to do. And they said, we actually want to go for it because no one's ever done it before. It'd be great. So they followed probably the most intense seven or eight weeks of our lives. And the result was that we won all three accounts. And to give you some idea of the size, that is like winning a billion rand. It's, it'd probably be equivalent about 1.5 million rand today, but that, that is like winning... That's like winning, you know, 100 million rands worth of business a month. And we had to put on 100 people in four weeks. It took us 19 years to grow the agency to a particular size. The next day, we were more than double that size. And, you know, there's a story that I will give you that's uh, related to this, and it's that of a French restaurant. We were a French restaurant. You know, we, we did... Beautiful work. It was crafted. It was lovely. And it's like someone comes to your restaurant and says, you know, in six months' time, can you serve 3,000 covers? You say, well, that sounds like a challenge. Yeah, yeah, we'll try. And you do. And then you wake up six months la later and you find you've become a fast food chain, which is fine. Fast food's fine, but it's not fine when you want to be a French restaurant. So my caution to you, and, and people say, oh, it serves you right, you were greedy. But what they don't realize is the only reason we pitched for all of that business is because people said it was impossible, not because the money was there. So a word of caution, and it's taken us a long time to try and get through that spell of dealing with um, that huge change to our culture, but I think we're getting back there now. We did Chesterfield ads to celebrate it. Every now and then, it's a good time idea to sleep on it. Before, after, no changes. Ha! What a laugh that is. And you know, um, Sir Martin Sorrell, who I'd spoken to five years before, who heads up WPP, didn't want to buy into the Jupiter drawing because he thought making a million round profit was pathetic. Five years later, I get a phone call from him saying, I'm reporting you to the Monopolies Commission, let's talk. And then he offers to invest and buy 49% of our agency for a lot of money. So the problem with that is he's only interested when you're big. He wasn't interested when we were good and small. 